This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you by BitRefill. BitRefill is the best way to spend your crypto in Latin America. Purchase gift cards or mobile refills from more than 3,500 brands in 186 countries instantly, safely, and privately. Visit bitrefill.com for more information. Welcome back to the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. My guest today is Michelle Coulson from Remote Rebellion. She's a remote career coach and helps people land remote jobs. So we welcome Michelle to the podcast. How's it going? Hello. Thank you. Yeah, really good. Thank you. Can't complain. Awesome. Where are you calling in from today? From Changu in Bali, Indonesia, for those who don't know now. <laughs> the the, the uh, Southeast Asian equivalent to Mexico. <laughs> awesome. So what time is it over there? It is just gone 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Okay, we're yeah. basically on the other side. It's uh, 8 a.m. <laughs> for, for me, but that's good. You got that morning energy. Yeah, just come out from the gym and you might see the red face. That's probably where it's from. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So Michelle, uh, I know we have actually a lot of overlap. You've appeared on a number of podcasts before. So for any of your super fans that listen to all your podcast episodes, we'll try to get to some uh, some questions and topics that you haven't talked about in previous episodes. But I've listened to your episodes on Han Talbot's podcast, uh, The Remote Life. I've listened to your episode with Chase Warrington and your episode with Curtis Duggan, Remotely Serious. All three of those guys and gal are previous guests of my Latin Life podcast. So everyone kind of knows each other at some point, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's a small world, right? And it's great. I got to meet two of those guys in person as well. So it's even nicer when you get to do that. Tell me the story. I met Han at um, Gran Canaria at an event in Gran Canaria um, at the Nomad City Fest, which was awesome because we just connected like we'd known each other for years, which is really lovely. And I find that a lot when you meet your your online friends on LinkedIn from Instagram and you actually get in person. It's, mm -hmm. it's super nice because everyone feels like they've known each other for years, but they have. They just haven't had that FaceTime. And Chase, I think I super fangirled him at um, a, a remote work conference in Ireland. And I think I went up to him, he's talking to someone else and I just got overexcited. I'm like, Chase, I'm a big fan. And I think my voice went really high and I'm like, oh my God, I just really embarrassed myself. <laughs> is he that good looking in real life or is that just he his is. photo? Yeah. <laughs> he is. And he's got a lovely wife too. <laughs> and a man bun. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you got rid not, of usually, not usually a fan of the man bun, but you know, it, it works it. <laughs> it works it. Cool. So you're obviously from Europe as well. Um, I, even though I listen to a bunch of podcasts from you, I'm not sure where exactly still. Really? Um, I'm from the yeah. UK, from the, from the motherland. <laughs> not, narrow it down, narrow it down. Where? Oh, from Manchester. Manchester. Okay. Yeah, cool. but I, I left. Uh, I left Manchester when I was about eighteen, so I don't have a really strong accent like I used to. I've had to. I've had to dim it down a little bit. Yeah, I I went partying in Manchester once in Oldham, I think. Interesting. Yeah, that happened. <laughs> I'm actually from Bolton, which is around the corner from there, but it's a it's a very interesting part of the world. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So. Uh, you help people get their first remote jobs. I would love to, I know uh, we're going to be talking about remote rebellion. Remote rebellion is your brand. Uh, so we're going to be talking about your brand. We're going to talk about how to get your first remote job. And I want it to be actionable. Like everyone in my audience is primarily Americans and Canadians um, who are already working remote and maybe just want to glean some additional tips or they're, you know, interested in this lifestyle and, they listen to us for inspiration and trying to make it happen in, in the very near future, right? So we'd love to make it as actionable as possible. The audience is already pretty convinced that remote's the way to go. And, you know, they all want to be in Latin America with me, uh, you know, eat, eating tacos and all that stuff. So <laughs> they know they know the benefits. And uh, one of the biggest questions I get is like, you know, I want to do what you're doing. I want to get multiple passports. I want to do the bank, you know, James Bond stuff speak multiple languages, bank accounts around the world, all that good stuff. But that can only really kick off once you have 
online income coming in. So hopefully we can, um, you know, pull back the curtains on that in this episode and talk about some of the most common ways to get a remote job. How are people making money online? Uh, that kind of thing. Sound good? Yep. Sounds good to me. Well, yeah, I guess first question, I mean, what are some of the most common tracks for making money online? I guess specifically for non-technical people. I would try and avoid, I would advise people to try and avoid looking at the most common tracks and instead look inside themselves on what they actually want to do and what they enjoy and what they're passionate about to a certain degree. They, they don't have to be passionate, it helps, but something that like lights them up a little bit. So people tend to go of like, what's the most common job? Well, you could say the most common job is data entry or virtual assistant, or it's starting your own business, but that might not resonate with you. So instead, try not to look at the path that everyone's going down and, and, and think about, right, get clear on what am I good at? What have I done before? I'm, I'm assuming most of your audience is pretty experienced in their fields or they, they've done work before. And a lot of people tell themselves the story of, yeah, but I've not done remotely. I had a guy who was a kitchen fitter. You know, he was like, kid, someone asked me right. what a kitchen fitter was. And I was like, he, he fits kitchens. I don't know how else to say this. <laughs> he, fits, he fits kitchens, for those of you who don't know what a kitchen fitter is. Um, and then someone else who was a dance choreographer on a cruise ship. These are two okay. very non-remote roles, non-digital, and they were right. not very techy. But they've had skills that they gained, not just from that, those roles, but from life that they didn't even realize that they had. So it took a bit of digging deep into, right, okay, so it sounds like you were doing very much the role of a HR person in in this thing that you did. And it looks like you enjoyed doing these parts. So really picking out those bits rather than telling yourself, I'm not technical, I can't work remotely, I'm not creative, I'm not, I don't want to start my own business. There are so many other options. You can work for a company, you can become a freelancer, you can start your own business. There are many different routes to go down and some of them really might not be what you started out to do and you might not have even known existed um, and it can be difficult because there's so much information out there as well I can I can mm. totally empathize with people okay cool so what did we do with the kitchen guy <laughs> so he really liked the um he ended up getting into seo and copywriting because he was super interested he wanted to during covid he and lockdown he was like okay what am i going to do people like the houses are closed so he started making desks out of like like um desks that people could use at home and then he's like okay i need to sell these desks i need to find a way to sell them so he kind of looked online tried to figure out how to create a website and he learned himself and i know i said that you don't have to be technical but he was very much not technical and he taught himself how to create a website a really basic one mm. and the importance of seo in actually getting people to that site and he hired people that you know, on Upwork or Fiverr for five euros an hour, 10 euros an hour, who knew the skills that he didn't have and could do it in half the time. So outsourcing that bit of money is is really worthwhile doing because it's going to free you up to do the things that you are good at. Okay, cool. And what about the dancer? What did we do with her? She ended up getting work in HR and ops, so people ops, because she was great with people. She was basically the mum of the cruise ship of these dancers and, and really helped and was there for them and was supportive and had done all of the, the role of someone who was in a, who, uh, good at their job. There's not many, uh, there's, there's a few of them that are not around, but like a really good HR person, you know, who really cares about the people and mm -hmm. wants the best for them. So she, she got into HR ops. Okay, cool, cool. Um, I, and you know what, to be completely honest, it, it really frustrates me when I uh, when I talk to I'm, I'm saying this wrong, but it, it does frustrate me when I talk to the career coaches and they just say, like, look at your passions, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, OK, I still have no idea what to actually do. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And that's why we, we break it down. It's like, OK, the thing that you did, the thing that you're good at. Have you thought about these roles? Because some people just you like go out and look for what's out there, but it's, it's so broad. And what what I what I tend to do as well is, if people really don't have a clue and they they don't know where to start, then we go on what they're interested in. Let's say they're interested in travel. Let's say they're interested in social impact. 
I, I, I give them a, a bunch of companies that are in that space and say, have a look at these, have a look at these companies, see what kind of jobs that they have and see what actually interests you. you there's loads of jobs that you might not have even known existed. And, and instead of thinking about what you don't have and that you don't have the skills for these roles, think, is that the kind of role that I would want to do? And if so, let's work on a path to actually get you there. And there's, okay. of course, that's a longer term strategy. And there's things that you can do to, to do in the short term. If you want to just get any remote job to start with, within reason, I don't advise anyone just gets any remote job because you're going to end up wanting to look again in the next six months. And searching and applying for jobs is a full-time job in itself, you know, to a certain degree. So I, mm -hmm. I don't advise anyone who says, I just want any remote job. I'm like, well, you don't. Just the same way you don't want any old partner. You, you, you want there's certain requirements that you want, and that's okay. Yeah, it, it, I think it's okay to start with that to say like, look, I just want to live in Brazil and make 3000 bucks a month and I will be happy. You know what I mean? But in terms of actually hitting the job market, you do, you do need to start getting more strategic than that. Right. And yeah. so it's, it sounds like maybe your strategy is like, okay, if you're a people person, let's look at sales, let's look at HR. If you're more nerdy, let's look at data entry, let's look at SEO. Is that kind of how you, you think about it? You kind of take the personality traits and then try to shoehorn the personality traits into, you know, one of the, the pillars of like common jobs. No, I wouldn't say so. Not typically because most people who come to me have some form of experience, like very few people come to me who have never entered the world of work before, for example. So people generally come with 10, 15 years of experience in something else. That might be something that they don't even feel like they can do remotely, or it might be something that is just not, not doable. Um, to be done remotely. But I'd say in most cases, like I get product managers, marketing, sales, finance, and they are doing the role in a, in a company on site and they just don't see the opportunities that are available to them remotely. They just don't think they're out there. And it's the same as anything. Unless you know where to look, you're going to make that assumption, well, I'm in finance, I'm in legal. They don't have any remote roles for me. They do. You just, they're, they're not as prevalent as technical roles and you just need to know where to look so I, I help them in finding them for them but also helping them search for those roles themselves okay cool so uh the people that you work with is it typically more like first time uh first time remote job seekers or is it uh, well i guess both groups are but is it people who are um already working like you said white collar roles and they're just looking to do the same thing remotely or is it people from kind of like non-computer, like people with computer jobs that are just looking to do kind of similar computer jobs remotely? Or is it more people who are just like not doing anything with the computer that want to start doing, you know, remote computer jobs? It's a real split. I'd say it's a really small percentage, maybe 5% who have never done a computer job, as you call it, um, before, and they want to get into that. That's like that quite a, <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go for computer job. Okay. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm imagining the cat now on the, on the keyboard. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sometimes I actually say with my friends is like, look, I'm just, I'm just typing my way to success here. Like, <laughs> I like that. Yeah. But I say that's that's a quite small percentage, and as I'd say the split of other people is people who have worked in a standard on-site office job, and then the pandemic came, and they were like, "Wow, we can do this!" And like like I did, "Wow, we can do this remotely." I'm I, I want to do more of this, and then it's like, "Okay, guys, back to the office now. This is you will pay for this real estate." And they're like, "Hang on a minute." I like this. Like, I want to do more of this. So that's a big chunk of people that I speak with. They, yeah, they've had a taste easier. of remote work. It's a lot easier. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah a lot exactly. Easier. And uh, less of a mental barrier, I, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, and then there's other about, people that have, ahead, sorry, I was just, just no, going to no, say there's ahead. other people that want a career switch and want to change in the industry that they're in and they're burnt out and they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. And some people are so like, um, so tired that they just don't know where to start and they're overwhelmed in getting that new job. So it's, it's not just necessarily the new remote job, it's the new job plus the remote element that makes it harder. Okay, cool. Um, so let's take someone with, uh, you know, some sort of computerish job that works in a normal, a normal job in London, right? Or, or uh, 
Manchester, right? And they're, they're working and they're like, I, I want to leave the UK. I just want to do something online. I do like pretty generic middle management stuff. Maybe it's sales, maybe it's HR, maybe it's accounting. How, what, what's the game plan for getting that person remote? So it's just, I, I went through a six step process and the first one is the analysis stage. So super important. The, the analogy I give is that what a lot of people do is they start building the house without getting an architect in to see what that looks like. So they're like, yeah, yeah, I, we'll figure it out as we go along. I kind of have an idea. I know what it looks like. I'm just going to start doing my resume and start applying. But they don't really get a clear picture of what the ideal is for them and we work on what's the ideal what's the absolute you know the dream I don't believe in a dream job let's say but it's the it's the dream life and the ideal job so the ideal and then in the middle ground there's like okay I'm happy to accept this and then there's absolutely no way will I do this like for example there's no way I'll work weekends or there's no way I'll work US hours if I'm in Australia you know there's certain requirements that you will absolutely not accept so we really mm -hmm get a clear picture of what that looks like so there's no ambiguity and they're not just going in um, spraying and praying and sending loads of applications and hoping for the best. And then they'll get that perpetuating motion of rejection emails that makes them their confidence dip and their motivation go. And then they don't want to apply to other stuff. So people think it's a numbers game. It's only really a numbers game if you've got a really high tolerance for these rejection emails. Like and not, people take them personally. You're going to do it. It feels personal. I am um, just saying that you shouldn't take it personally. doesn't stop them doing that. So mm. full analysis. Then there's actually working on the strategy. So not just going on LinkedIn, scrolling on LinkedIn, see what there is, applying to a few roles, and then that's it. It's diversifying the same way you would an investment of different job boards, of networking, of um, reaching out to, in different places, making open applications. How are you going to go about that? And then we work through, I won't go through with all the six steps, but essentially, but and then we go into actually the working on your profile. So sorting out your resume, your cover letters, mm -hmm. your LinkedIn profile, so you can actually attract people as well as have a good profile so that when they look at you, they, they want to hire you or they want to have a conversation with you. And a really big, big important piece of this is the networking because people will typically hire someone that's had a referral from someone at the moment you're just vance your name on screen who does this job you're you're not at this point human it sounds awful to say but you are just a name on a screen until we've had this conversation it's like oh vance we we, we chatted on that podcast you should speak to him he'd be great for this role that referral mm -hmm. is worth its weight in gold because yeah. i might not have considered you based on your cv i might have been like Meh, yeah, average you know skip ahead same way you would swipe away but the fact that someone said you should speak to him, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prioritize you over other people because you become okay. human, you become a referral. So are, are you suggesting people do a mix of cold applying and referral stuff? Or are yeah. you just like, yo, 100% focus on referrals and working an angle? No, I definitely think a mix. And that's, it's all about the di diversifying, optimizing your profile and engaging so that people come to you, making the applications and making sure that they pop when you're sending those applications and also the referral and the networking piece. So almost doing them in three parts um, is, is, is really key for this. This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you by Language Blend, the new best way to learn Spanish. Language Blend focuses on what you actually need to live and get by abroad with daily one-on-one -on -one lessons, a dedicated texting partner. It's like living in a Spanish-speaking country without ever leaving home. Go to languageblend.com for more information. Okay. And what should someone say like to their, to their friends when it's like, hey, can you ask your network if they know anyone that has online jobs. Obviously, it's a bit more specific. It's like, hey, do you know anyone that needs SEO help? Do you know anyone that needs a salesman? How, like, have you refined a good sort of template for, um, you know, more, yeah, sort of like, I wouldn't say cookie cutter, but making referrals a more repeatable process? Yeah, it's a good question. I think there's a few ways to do it. First of all, I, I would reframe it, classic sales technique. Don't ask a closed question, like who do you know, rather than 
do you know? Like, who do you know that is looking for salespeople in the remote workspace right now? And that will then leave them, rather than a yes, no, they'll think about who they know. That's one way. But another way is actually to get themselves out there at networking events, whether that's in person, whether that's online. Of just the more people you're meeting, the more people you're communicating, you're, you're becoming that, that brand recognition. Coca-Cola doesn't need to advertise. Everyone knows Coca-Cola, like, but they still do it because they really want to get in your head. And it's like, hello, I'm here. And it's the same when you're job seeking and finding that really fine balance between showing an interest and showing that you're engaged and not pestering someone and, and, and she's seeming desperate. It's, it, it is really that, that fine balance to do that. So just doing the work, doing the outreach, being there and being present, as well as actually getting referrals from people like you mentioned. Okay, cool. Um, do you use any softwares to like mass apply for the cold apply stuff? Or are you doing like easy apply on LinkedIn, like clicking through, like easy apply, submit, easy apply, submit, easy apply, submit. Or do you have like a software that you use that like does like a hundred a minute or, or something like that? Have you have you introduced some 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 no. fancy techniques here? No, because I, I I believe my my personal opinion is because I've been the one. I was a recruiter for seven years before setting up Remote Rebellion. I've been the one reading these, and I've had I've just had a social media role advertised. I had nine hundred and fifty applications in nine days, Ooh. so Remote that's Rebellion. a hell of a lot. To, yeah, there's a hell of a lot to get internally through. for your company. Yeah, cool. Okay. So the amount of like chat GBT answers, generic people not answering the question, <laughs> like it's, it's crazy. So I, I've seen of all of these things that the mistakes people are making. So I've seen on both sides. So I really recommend people instead don't see it as a numbers game. And instead of sending 20, 30 applications a day, a week, send like 10, 15% of that and make sure that they are highly tailored and they're, they're actually the roles that you want to do. Because that what that means is less rejection emails and it's roles that you actually want to do and you have to put consideration into there. And you're more likely to get them because the people are going to read them and think, ah, this person's actually put some time into this. Hmm. What are some of the most common mistakes? I would say typos, not reading the answer, not reading the question properly, uh, not following instructions. If someone's asked for a two minute loom video and they do a three minute loom video, that really <laughs> irritates me. I'm like, I, I, I like short snappy and you're giving me a five minute video. I'm not going to watch this. It's too long. I haven't got time to watch 950 like five minute videos. So yeah, those, those are really common mistakes. And when people comment on a LinkedIn job or Facebook job, whatever it is, I'm interested. I'm like, show me you're interested don't just write your interest would you want me to be like oh thank you for your interest let me let me go out my way to these ten thousand i'm interested comments and reach out to them show your interest by reaching out to the person finding that email and and show what value you can add rather than making it about you make it about what you can give to them what value you can add okay cool so Sorry if I seem a bit harsh. <laughs> no, no, I like it. I mean, I, I wanted this to be uh, as actionable as, as possible. We've had a couple like recruiters and stuff in the past. I, like, for example, I remember one that changed my resume. This is just random, but maybe it'll inspire you to think of some things. But he said, your resume should be black and white so that the... Um, like the screen readers or resume automated resume readers can read it because sometimes they can't read red and yellow and some of these colors. And I was like, huh, that kind of makes sense. And then I made my yeah. resume all black. So I, I even I was like gleaning things from from some of these uh, podcasts I've done. But I, I I don't know from other people's perspectives, but I I worked in recruitment for what seven eight years. And it was always a human that was first reviewing that CV and not an automated AI robot. I think people have this illusion that a lot of the times they have to beat the ATS or they have to beat the AI. In most cases, at least from my own experience, it is a human that is reading that that's that on your screen. So you, you need for to now. make it clear to them for sure. Yeah, for now, exactly. Um, but you do need to make it clear to them why you're suitable in those first few seconds. Mm-hmm. And I guess you probably DM the recruiter as well and say like, hey, I just submitted my resume. Here's my Calendly maybe. Do you use Calendly? Actually, that's a good question. Like how do you – because 
they always reach out and say like, Hey, how do, how can I get in contact with you? And I'm like, my Calendly is on my resume. Like what? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yes. Or, you have a couple things like this. Yeah. I, I use Calendly. I, I, and I, I used to, used to recommend that people reach out to the recruiters to say, Hey, I just submitted my application, but I would actually warn people against that now. I think because there are so there's so much competition for remote jobs now that these recruiters, the high managers, they're getting inundated. So you're not actually standing out anymore because everyone's doing the same. What I would definitely do is to follow up if it's been a week, two weeks, and you haven't heard anything back, and mm-hmm. then and then follow up and say, here's my here's my CV, here's my resume. I applied on this day. Like, what's the timeline for this? Definitely in that case because you might have got lost in the in the black hole of the applications, but you can reach out and maybe you'll get somewhere by reaching out on LinkedIn, but I, I, I would put your effort and time elsewhere. Yeah. That, do you, do you know any software up. hacks for this? Like, can't you, I don't overly do this, but you can schedule emails in the future, right? So you could send the resume now and then also write the email now to send three days from now and be like, Hey, I'm just following up, blah, blah, blah. But you like created it the second you made your resume. Have you done you could, like but that? then you've got the error of like, if you've forgotten, you've scheduled it and then you're in an interview process and then they get that email. So yeah, that, that, that that's a way you could do it. I, I, I do it a little bit of a more of a manual way in that I, I advise people to track the jobs that they're applying to on a spreadsheet or teal, whatever they want to use. Mm-hmm. And, and then they'll have like a, a, a formula where it's been two weeks since application and they'll go in and send the email to the, so it's a little bit more manual, but yeah, you could automate it, but there, there is that risk there that you could, send that email and you're actually already in process with them. Okay, cool. Uh, do you do anything in terms of having multiple profiles and multiple resumes? Like I have a buddy, he has two different LinkedIn's with like slight variations of his name. And one is more like a product manager one. And then one's more like a quality analyst one. Right. So you could kind of do like two, like obviously a lot of, like a lot of people have done two different types of resumes but actually having two different whole profiles. That's interesting. I've not heard of people going the extra mile to have a whole different LinkedIn profile. That is interesting. (laughs) Um, What I would say is to have different versions of your resume, I I wouldn't necessarily recommend, not that I wouldn't recommend, having having a tailored resume for each job is probably the best way to go. I do air quotes in that. But not everyone has the time to do that. Like, I, I, and I, yeah. most people I'm working with are working full time. They got families. They got they got stuff to do. They don't have yeah. time to tailor their resume for every single job. So I, I talk about having themes of them. So it, that might be one yeah. you're targeting startups. Another one is maybe product manager, and the other one is maybe project manager CV. But when it comes yeah. to your LinkedIn. I don't necessarily recommend having a different version of LinkedIn because, again, that's really time-consuming, and then you're going to have to build up different connections on each one. So yeah. it's, a, it's a big use of time. So instead, what I would say is have a look at when someone lands onto your LinkedIn profile and gets one of the versions of your CVs, does it make sense? Does it connect? Yeah. And if you're applying for project manager one minute and you're applying for something like designer the next then it's going to, it might be a little bit weird it's like what are they are they people like people who fit into boxes in most cases it's not the right way but they they want to see you have applied for project manager are you project manager okay so really make it obvious and it doesn't have to all be in the job titles but in your headline it might be that you've got project manager, designer, software engineer, whatever that is. Like, so it makes mm. sense that immediately when they look at that, like, ah, he, this CV was this, but it matches with that. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Like if, like if you're technical, maybe you'd have like a JavaScript resume and then a Python resume and then kind of highlight a different technology stack or something. And then mm. the... Not necessarily because depending, I, I, I always say this a lot because it depends. Is there a benefit of you having the fact that you have understood and picked up different languages? Yes, in most cases, that means you like you can you can yeah. one minute you can you, you maybe polyglot. You may one, one minute you're looking yeah, at Python, the both. next minute you look at this. <laughs> it's kind of a bad example because those are very close together. But in terms of languages, okay, I have a random question. But how would you title the file? Would it be Michelle Coulson CV 2023? 
or how are you titling it in maybe a way that stands out or something like that? The That's file a good name. question. I've never had that question before. I honestly don't think it matters too much. Put the name, put the role, put the year. I would not tailor it for the job or the company. And there's t- two different versions of thought here. And I always say that my opinion isn't the, the, the golden truth. Like this is, this is what I say. But if I see a CV that's completely tailored for that job and for that company, and like they just, they reworded this so that they fit into the box, maybe they don't actually have any of this. And I use the analogy in dating. If you had been set up on a blind date with someone, and I'll set up on a date with someone by a friend, and you want to go and check out their Instagram, you're looking, oh, they're, in, they're into some of the same things I am. They're, they're surfing, they're skiing. We're probably going to have some stuff to talk about. This is really interesting. But then if you look again and take a closer look, and you see they've changed all of their photos like yesterday to adapt, and you're like, your friends probably told them that you're into these things and they've changed all of their profile around to fit in. You'd be like, it's a bit creepy. And I don't know what's true. Are they actually into those things or have they just changed it for me? Mm-hmm. Okay. That'd be pretty adept <laughs> to notice, but tailoring, tailoring is probably a good idea though. All, all else considered. Okay. Yes. Cool. Just don't make it really so, obvious. It's for that company. So tailor right. it, but just don't make it obvious. Do you do anything in terms of like making it more efficient though? Like, are you using like, maybe you're like hot keying phrases, like, you know how when you like apply on LinkedIn, there's like a comment box and maybe you could like hot key uh, and it's like, I'm interested in this role because I'm creative, blah, blah, blah. Or I don't know, that's just a random example, but have you in your many years of doing this, have you thought of any strategies for just making this as efficient as possible? Because it can literally take hours every day. Like it's insane. Like it's extremely time consuming, especially when you get into the tailoring things approach. And then especially when you also get into, you know, taking the first round interviews and, and this and that, like, do you have any tips for making things more efficient? Sure. I'm sensing, sensing some pain here of, uh, of applications and I can, I can, I can relate because it is, it's, it eats up so much of your time. Um, what are the ways I use this tool? I really should be on commission for these guys because I recommend them to everyone, but they're, it's called Magical Text Expander. I don't know okay. if you use it. And it's heard of it. basically sh- shortcuts on your, it's a Chrome extension and it's shortcuts. So if I want to say, hey, recruiter, thanks for, very much for your message, but I'm only interested in these kind of roles, blah, 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 blah. You can just type in a shortcut where you put in NT and then the whole yeah. phrase comes up. Like, for okay. example, Magical you're, you're writing this down, aren't you? <laughs> I can send it to you afterwards if you want. <laughs> That's one way. Another is a tool called Teal. Again, not affiliated with them. I just think they have a really good product. And for now, parts of it is free. And T-E-A-L. what you can do is you... T-E-A-L, yeah. Um, what else you would you search have, with that? Teal? Teal um, job, I think. So it will definitely come up if you just type in okay. Teal. Teal job imagine. tracker. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's it. Okay. So what you can do is you can put in, you can follow companies on there and track them there. And you can also put in the job description and it will tailor your CV slightly for that. So it's all like automated in that mm. way. It's pretty cool. Okay. Definitely check it first though. I would a hundred percent check it first. You can also use chat GPT. So you can say, this is the job ad copy paste. This is my CV copy paste, create a cover letter. I always check it first and always adapt but that's, that's not creating like a fake cover letter that's not about what you've done, but it's combining the two together. So I have templates that I share with my rebels, as I call them, which is like a cover letter template, CV template that they can then adapt and change. But that's one of the ways that you can do it to kind of save a little bit of time. And also- Do you always both, do a cover letter? Uh, yes, if there's space to do it. Yeah. But don't do it in the way that we've been taught where it's super formal. You're just summarizing your CV. One line sometimes can be more effective than a whole one page of a, of one a cover letter. cover letter, okay. It could be. It depends. Like, for example, I got one. I got a line. I don't ask for a cover letter in my application form. I don't, um, I don't ask for a CV and a cover letter in the job that I had posted. But instead I was like, is there anything else you'd like to add? And someone wrote something like, I want to be part of your newsletter just so I can roast your call to action. And I'm like, I like that. 
like that's the first person to kind of zing me a little bit and that works because my company's called Remote Rebellion. They've seen I call people out on their BS. So that kind of sass really, really resonated with me. And, and I was like, get this person in. So think about your audience. What is going to grab their attention? Like if they're the kind of company where you can give a bit sassy, you can even swear in it, then do it. Like stand out. But if they're a really formal, like traditional organization, then adapt to the tone a little bit and just point something out that's going to really grab their attention. Your cover letter is the chance to grab attention and be personalized to them. Like speak to them. What what are you going to offer them that is going to help them? Save them time and money, usually. And for these remote roles, what does the job process look like, the recruitment process? Like, what, you know, what have you seen in terms of how many calls is it or is it an, a phone call and then the next step is a video call or what's the timeline? There's no one size fits all. I've seen anything from one phone call, one interview done to six, seven stages of interviews. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's um, It can be ridiculous, but I just, I'm not saying that the companies who do six, seven stages are bad because some of them are really cool companies to work for and they just make you jump through a few more hoops. Mm -hmm but it, it varies. A lot of times what companies are doing now is they're asking you to do a Loom video, for example, where you spend a few minutes talking about why you're a good fit for the role. And what they're trying to get there is not necessarily your experience, but they want to see how you communicate and how you come across on screen. Do you have good lighting, sound, audio? Are you set up to be a good remote worker? That's a part of what they're assessing as well. If you've got super crappy audio and, no, and, and like really noisy background and it shows that you don't you're not set up already, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I know what you're saying. Hey guys, quick interruption to tell you about BitRefill. BitRefill is the best way to convert your crypto into gift card balances. These are gift cards that you can spend at Hotels.com, Airbnb, Nike, and many more. You may remember Joel Valenzuela, previous podcast guest. He's been living on crypto exclusively since 2015, and he's a big consumer of BitRefill. And so I asked Joel, I said, what do you like most about BitRefill? He said that he likes the instant delivery, the precise amount so that you don't have to juggle a lot of gift cards, and he loves the global selection. Nobody else has this much selection of gift cards, over 10,000 gift card options across hundreds of countries. Go to bitrefill.com to sign up. And you can also use the code MyLatinLife for 10% back off your first purchase. Go to bitrefill.com for more information. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, with technical things, um, like with technical jobs, software jobs, it can be a number of steps because they're really trying to assess your ability. Um, but with non-technical stuff, I assume it's like a little bit different and it's just based on the vibe, uh, are, for non-technical roles, do they often ask you to do like free work or like if it's copywriting, do they say, hey, you know, write me some copy for free or if it's, uh, I don't know, or like what, what are, you know, if it's product management, do they say, hey, put, put together a wireframe or something for me or like what are, you know, what what's like within bounds for, for them, um, asking you to do like quote unquote free work or like a mini project thing? They, I mean, in theory, they can ask you to do anything. They can ask you to do a like 10 hour project to submit. And, and this is a really sad thing because it's such a company driven market right now. And these candidates are desperate in a lot of cases, especially in the remote workspace, because there's less of them. There's fewer jobs and more people going for those jobs that they can ask people to jump from through hoops and they will do. It's really, it's sad, and that some most of them are not doing it just for the sake of it. They they think right, we've got nine hundred applications. Let's say, how are we going to figure out who are the good ones in here? We've got we've got we we have the power here because we've got more of these applications, so we can really assess if they're the right fit. And it's it's really sad because people who are maybe carers for someone or have stuff that they are doing and they don't have the time to put into doing this for everyone are going to miss out. So it's, it's, it's really harsh. I can see why the companies are doing it, but it's, it's really harsh for the people who are actually applying for these jobs. So that is something I've seen. I've seen big projects. I've seen other companies that will actually pay you 
to do the project. They want to see the work, but they're willing to pay you, which is really good. I think Zapier did that or GoDaddy or something. I, I, I can't remember, but that, that that's one great thing. But what I'm seeing a lot of is sadly the amount of ghosting that's happening for people who have done one, two, three interviews and they just yeah. never hear anything back. Like that's the thing that really gets me and I am ready to call out. If anyone hears about any of that, come to me, tell me. I'm going to call these people out because it's so it's just so wrong. Like people have invested hours of their time and just to not even hear back to say, no, we're not moving forward or this is the feedback we're giving you. And you think it's because they're afraid of lawsuits and stuff? I think it's a mixture of candidates are just numbers because there's so many of them coming through. Um, and the not giving feedback is, is lawsuit is, is definitely a reason for that. It's, I, I, I tend to, give feedback on a call rather than in, in writing, just so that, you know, you can then have a, have a call, give them the feedback they need, but it's not there in writing just in case anything goes wrong. It's, it's sad that that's what it's come to, right. but I think that is one of the reasons. It's not a right fit for the company culture. And it's like, it's cause I'm black. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. Like there's, you've got to be really careful now. Um, yeah. it's, it's sad that it's come to that, this whole like Sioux culture. Yeah. Um, where do you think is um, an interesting opportunity in terms of where do you think is oversaturated and undersaturated, whether that be in terms of company size or roles that uh, aren't receiving a lot of candidates relative to the open opportunities there? You know what I mean? Do you, do you tell your clients to target big companies or small companies or where do you kind of see more opportunity right now? I tell them to target the companies that they're interested in. So if they're interested in big corporates, target them. If they're interested in small startups, target them. I would say if you, unless you genuinely want to work from anywhere, you want to be in Mexico one minute, you want to be in Southeast Asia another, you want to be in Australia, try not to target those companies because they will have way more competition. So if you are like, well, I'm probably going to spend most of my time in the US, go for US remote roles um, that they will have way less competition than the work you're from saying, anywhere. You're saying companies. work for anywhere roles that explicitly say work for ever, any, from anywhere have more competition? Yeah, yeah way more. Because they're, they're in demand. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, they will do because they can do because, again, it's a, it's a supply and demand thing. People are going for them. They can, they can, I've seen even companies lowball people. They've advertised the role as 40, 45K and mm. then they've got through to the interviews so actually it's 30 35 now because they, they they've had other people that are interested like it's like some sort of like um auction which is awful yeah talking about salary when's the best time to do that um at least kind of in the tech industry that's typically done on like the very first call where you say like what are the salary expectations what's your range and it's it's a bit of a what's the word like who's showing their cards first type of thing where they say like, how much are you looking for? And then you go, I don't know. What's the, do you have a budget for the role? And they're like, yeah, we have a range. And, and <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. like, what, do, yeah. what do you recommend there? I actually just posted a video uh, about like yesterday or the day before I, I did a little sketch with my nephews and they would do, they were being the interviewees and I was being the interviewer. So it was fun. If you want to check that out on my, on my uh, socials. Um, Where is that? What, it, what social would that be on? So it was on Instagram and LinkedIn, uh, Remote Rebellion on both places. You're not big on Twitter, are you? Do you have Twitter? No, I have it, but I'm not big on it. Okay. Because that's Too where, many that's platforms. I see it though. Oh, you okay. Have the rebellion. I'm following you right yeah, now. It exists. It <laughs> yeah, exists. you've got a new follower. <laughs> um, but yeah, to answer your question, always ask for it. People are really wor worried that they're going to come across as, you know, just in it for the money, which is silly because it's a job and you, you're in it for the money. Um, uh -huh. But the, there are ways around to ask it. So if the recruiter on that first initial screening call does not ask, then you can ask a question. They usually say, have you got any questions for us? First question, non-salary related. Second, make it a quick one. Second question, um, can you tell me what the salary range is for this role, please? And there's a few ways that they'll answer. They'll either say the number, which is rare, um, or they will say, oh, well, we're not too sure. It depends on experience. 
or we're not too sure, like we're going to speak to other candidates. So there's a few ways you can play it. First of all, know your range. Know what the absolute minimum is you will be willing to accept for a role that you're interested in. What is the absolute minimum based on where you think you're going to be based? And what is like a bit of a cheeky ask? So that is your range. Don't feel like you, like even if that's a 50K range, give that range. And how I would answer that is that I would actually say, well, I'm interviewing between 20 and 30K. Um, does, that, does that align with your budget for this role? And what you do then is you, you look confused there. No, it's just a low number. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an example number. I just gave that number. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But that could be 50 to 100K. No, I, you could I, I give like that the wording. I like, I like the wording that you said. I'm mm. interviewing between... Yeah. Or like, yeah, yeah, I like, I like that wording. And because then you're also telling them, hey, I'm in demand if you want me. And you're going to have to pay, pay a bit more. And how big of a range would you recommend? Obviously, it depends on like how, what that number is. But would you say like 40 to 60? That's obviously like a 50% difference. Do you, you know, do you... It depends. As long as the range is realistic then the range to a certain degree doesn't matter, especially if you're in a sales role and that could include OTE or, you know, on-target earnings. Like, it, it depends. Uh -huh. Just think about the absolute minimum. If they offer me this role now at this role, at this salary, would I be happy to accept that? So give that give that minimum and give the cheeky ask at the end. So that's, that's the main thing. Like, it, are you asking for 100K as your maximum, but you've just got out of college? Probably that's a bit of a silly uh, silly one to put in there. So make sure that it's realistic for the market, for your experience. Got it. And I assume on the first call, you'd also ask, is this full-time versus contract, that kind of thing? Yeah, they um, will usually put that in the job ad. It's usually quite obvious if, if it is a full-time or contract. Um, it's usually put in there. One good question to ask would be around how, like, especially if it's a work from anywhere role, how are you paying um, the employees? Is it through an employee of record? Is it, um, as a, are you a fixed term contractor? How are you actually, how, how are people, yeah, how are you paid? Yeah, it is. Yeah, for the international things, because I'm more familiar with like U.S. employers and U.S. making money in general. But like for for international stuff, I imagine with these work from anywhere companies, it's it can be kind of crazy. It's like okay, so like the headquarters of this company is like in Bulgaria, but they're like paying me through Singapore. Or like all, I imagine there's <laughs> lots of like wacky setups. So you really probably have to clarify that. It's like look. I, does it like, are you going to pay me on transfer wise? That kind of thing, you know? Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't cover that kind of question until later on down the line. Um, just because as long as the salary rate and the kind of like the tax is something that you are happy doing, um, happy sort of accepting, that's kind of complications later on down the line. You really want to figure out if the role in the company is the right fit for you first. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I know this has been very like grilling-ish, but I hope you're <laughs> enjoying it as well. I, hope, I just hope the yeah. audience gets more value. I, I have podcast episodes where I just let the guy talk for like 10 minutes. Don't say <laughs> anything because it's like something else. But with this resume stuff, I feel like it's the best way to do it is just to be like, what about this? What about this? What about this? So yeah. I don't know. I'm, it's a little I'm bit typically a more short and, stuff, short and snappy with my answers anyway. So I, I, I think it works with both of us. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I got a juicy one for you. What about job stacking? What about overemployment, maintaining multiple jobs? What about it? Um, have you ever tried it? Not full time ones. I've only ever done it from I've moved from a permanent role to freelancing to setting up my business, and I freelance at the same time setting up my business. But I've never. No, I've never job stacked in terms of doing two full time roles. Or like, I just don't have the time or the energy. Because <laughs> here, here's what I was thinking about when you said, like, you know what? If you get a role in your range and you're willing to sign, just sign. Is um, I've had situations where, with me or with or with other people or whatever, where if you get an offer and the vibe is not renegotiating the offer for whatever reason, and it's like, look, I'm signing or I'm not signing just sign it because even if you sign it and then say like, look, I can't start for whatever reason, my grandma died, whatever it is, right? 
Like they're, they're not going to like sue you or something. Right. So you might as well just like, you might as well just secure a potential revenue stream. You know what I mean? Yep. Where it's like, look, if someone's giving me a job offer, even if like, I know I'm not going to take it because like, whatever, I, I don't know, you might as well, like I'm moving to Bali and like it's in person at the Foot Locker in Manchester, whatever, just, just sign it. Right. Cause at least it's like a potential future cash flow. And like, if you walk away, even after you sign, like there's usually nothing they can really do, you know? To a certain degree, I would agree with you on like looking out for number one, especially when it's like don't like burn the bridge, obviously. Yes. In some situations, you want to burn the bridge, but like in a lot of cases with these like Acme Corp anonymous companies and stuff like that, you kind of can't. I don't know. Yeah. No, to a certain degree, I, 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 to a certain point, I would, I would agree with you because you, you have to look out for number one. Who's more important, this company or your family and your like, like what you're looking for. So yeah. yeah. Like if it's a paper company in Missouri and you've never been within 500 miles of there, like just accept the offer, you know what I mean? Like, and just like, even if, and then if something, and then the idea is like, if you get more offers because you're going through a job process and more offers are coming in and you're like, okay, I'll just sign this one, whatever. Cause you know, it's going to expire. If I don't sign it, they're going to choose someone else. But I'm really waiting on this other role. And like, if this other one comes in, I'll like jump on that instead. Like, I don't know, have you? I, you... I would say yes to that, but I, I would actually go backwards and actually not invest time in these opportunities that you don't actually want in the first place, because that's going to eat up your time and energy. So why not use that time on roles and companies that you actually do want? That's why, and that's why I, I wouldn't recommend people to to go for for roles that are maybe hybrid and say, oh, well, when I get to the interview and I impress them, that's when they're going to be like, okay, we'll allow them to work remotely. The chances of that are really slim. So unless you're actually in a company at the moment and you're trying to negotiate it for you to work fully remote, it's going to be very, very difficult to convince a company that's set that hybrid is their term and for you to work fully remote, unless you've really shown them um, for months on end that you are amazing and then you can convince them. It's just a, it's a longer game and it's a much more uphill battle. Hey everybody. Hey everybody. Quick break from the podcast to tell you about Language Blend, the best new way to learn Spanish. Language Blend was co-founded by Jake Nomada, friend of the podcast, decade of experience in Latin America. And Jake and his team, they put everything into this program that they wish they had in terms of how to level up quickly with your Spanish language skills. Because the faster that you can get conversationally fluent in Spanish, the better the experience that you're going to have in Latin America. So go to languageblend.com for more information. With kind of job stacking in mind, I'm not trying to get you in trouble, but like one of the things that prevents job stacking from being possible is when there's too many calls per day and then you have like overlapping meetings that happen at the same time. And so a lot of job stackers, they're sort of looking for roles that have a very minimal amount of calls, like one call a day type of thing. And even if you're not job stacking, I think that's like the ideal role where you're not on the phone like too much and they just leave you alone because then you can kind of like escape to go surfing in Bali in the morning or just like you can go to the cafe and work there. Whereas like if you had to be on a like a, a call, you can't really go to the cafe because there's too many like clinking coffee hmm. cups and stuff like that. So, I mean, do you do anything in terms of that, in terms of filtering and saying like, you know, what's the expectation in terms of like how many calls, meetings, anything like that? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. A lot, a lot of remote first companies will actually declare their policy and like whether they have flexible hours, whether they have times that you have to be on. So a lot of them will do talk about that. What a great thing to come of um, the pandemic has happened as well as like remote work opening up is a lot of companies now are going mostly or fully async. So they're working asynchronously. There's a job yeah. board that I really like to rec recommend called findasync.com mm -hmm. and they only advertise asynchronous companies, which I think is really cool. So that's some, if you really are one of those people, you do not want to be tied down by hours. And usually hours means calls, right? Then mm -hmm. I would look for asynchronous companies. That would be a way to go down there. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, but they, I feel like the async ones are like really competitive. So you almost need to like find something that's like accidentally async. You know, <laughs> there's no such thing. You can't be like, accidentally async. It takes yeah. really, it takes a lot of effort to do. Yeah. Do you know Kristen Vieira? Yes. She's another remote work coach. Yeah, she's she's awesome. We have an episode with her as well. It's unreleased as at this point ah. in time, but it'll come out before yours. Uh, and she uh, she mentioned uh, findasync.com as well. Yeah, they're really good. I, I, the two founders are lovely as well. I've spoken to her a few times. But yeah, Kristen's amazing. I, I actually collaborated with her and Jordan Carroll. He's like another remote job coach. And the three of us were doing, uh, you should get him on. He's, he's, he's a character. Um, but okay. the three of us t- together were we're doing a collaboration on ranking different job boards. You should check it out on YouTube. We were basically saying who are the, who are the good ones, who are the bad ones. Um, and it, we collaborated together on that. Okay. Could you kind of reveal that a bit? Like who, what are the best job boards? One of them was, um, I think the top one ended up be, uh, being jobgever.com. And they're awesome because it's not actually a job board, it's an aggregator. So you put in the job title you want, where you want to work from, whether that's Mexico, whether that's anywhere in the world, and it will show you all of these jobs that come up. It's amazing. It's so good. And we were just raving about it. <laughs> okay. Keep and going the on the list. How, how far uh, down which... the list is LinkedIn? <laughs> oh, LinkedIn's not on there. It's not on there. Everyone uses LinkedIn. Everyone uses LinkedIn. And... LinkedIn doesn't have decent filters to filter out these fake remote jobs. So people post jobs that are remote, but that are actually remote. And that's why I'm constantly banging on about them on, on my LinkedIn of like reporting these companies because LinkedIn needs to do something better and it must have the capability to do it. But I think there's something bigger at play, some real estate backhand money going on. I just, I, I won't get into this now. We haven't got time, but there's... There, there must be a way that they can make the filter better for those remote jobs and they just choose not to. You think there's a lot of fake job postings now or they're just misleading in terms of... They're, they're misleading. Yeah, so the, what they'll say is they'll, when you're doing a filter and you're looking for just remote and then you'll scroll down to the bottom of the job, it's like, must be in the office two days a week. Like, it's just ridiculous. And it wastes so much of people's time because they have to go and look for that manual. And some of them, they don't even say it in the job ad. And when they go to apply, can you come to Boston twice a week? You know, like it's, <laughs> yeah, it's really bad. Pretty far from Bali. Okay, so <laughs> jobgather.com, you want to hit us with a couple more? Let me think at the top of my head. There's um, Europe remote jobs, which is probably not the right for your, um, your target Europe audience. Europe remote jobs. Yeah. Where you and only make pre- 1500 a month. <laughs> hey it's not that bad <laughs> and then there's um we work remotely.com is a really good one i quite uh-huh. like that uh remote okay is good for tech jobs it's quite a few i've got a list of like 130 specialist job boards so it's like um it's yeah there's there's a lot out there but you just need to know where to look cool cool tell us about remote rebellion Well, when I was working as a recruiter in London and the pandemic happened, the office was closed. So my friend said to me, hey, why don't you come to Bali for a couple of months, work from here? So I did. My boss called, said, come back to the office. Um, Two months later, I was like, absolutely not. I love it here. I want to stay. And he's like, well, you can't. Like Company policy says you need to be in London or whatever he said. And I just felt really annoyed. I felt angry. I've been working this way for the past 18 months, perfectly fine. I was productive. I was happier. I was healthier. I was like living my best life and getting my work done. You know, it was a perfect combo. And he he was like, no, you, you can't. So I was like, right, well, I quit. And that's when I realized I, I was a little bit arrogant, I guess. I was like, I'm good at what I do. I'm a good recruiter. I've got jobs in the past, no problem. I've got a good network of people but I didn't anticipate how hard it was to look for remote jobs compared to on site. It was a whole different ball game. And I realized if I'm struggling, I've got this network, I know all of this knowledge from my, my years in recruitment, then other people are gonna be struggling too. 
So that's when I set up at Moment Rebellion. And I wanted to, I wanted to really help people from step by step, not just helping them with their CV. That's what I thought they needed at first, but it was way more than that. Actually, people needed more support and guidance throughout the whole process. So I help people from analysis to strategy, to working on their applications, to interviewing, to networking, to really make sure that they get a job that, that aligns with their values and it pays well as well. It's not just any old job. So I've been doing that now for the past two and a half years. And then we have just launched uh, this week, Remote Rebellion Retreat, uh, which I'm super excited about. So this is for people, it's a two week trip in Thailand with the Remote Job Academy combined in it. For people who are in jobs at the minute, who only get like maybe two weeks vacation time a year, they don't have enough time to search for a job, do their full-time job and actually have time to rest and sleep because they're just, they're going in this hamster wheel and they don't know how to get out of it because they don't have the time to see, even sit and think about what they want before actually going in and applying. So that's, um, that's the, in a nutshell. I know I spoke really fast because I got really excited then. <laughs> so sorry about that. So this is a new branch of the company is my understanding yeah. is you're going to start running a whole bunch of retreats. Yeah, well, not a bunch. Like 26th of February is the, the first one. It's going to be the only one of 2024 because um, mm. I've got loads of other stuff happening in the year. I can't commit to anything. So this is going to be two weeks of rest, recuperation, digital detox for a day or two in this beautiful um, national park surrounded by a lake on these floating bungalows. And then we get into the nine days of essentially a boot camp style of working on what it is that they can do and want to do remotely, whether that's freelancing remote, whether it's getting a remote job. That might even be that they decide to start their own business. Like it's really going to strategize how they can change their life and, and work from wherever they want. Cool, cool. So your main business is coaching, and then this is the new thing is, I guess, well, it's just one off is the, the retreat. Well, this and is coaching at the same time, I guess. Yeah. It's just yeah, in yeah. person. <laughs> and you hit the conference circuit like you go to all the remote conferences and stuff not all of them but i started going to them this year so i did running remote in lisbon uh, i did uh -huh. grow remote in ireland um nomad city in gran canaria i also did um another um, nomad island uh, first the very first digital nomad festival in ireland which was amazing it was super good so yeah i, I, I love doing those in-person events that's cool. You know John Lee? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I met him a couple of times. Great guy. Yeah, cool. He's another podcast guest. Nice. Have you done any of the any, any circuit? Are you going to do them next year? or? I, ha I haven't really done the circuit. I was tempted to do the Lisbon one running remote, but mm. maybe, maybe, yeah. You should. Come, come in April. There's going to be a big bunch. What do you guys, it's like, is it more like industry sort of like B2B or is it? You know what I mean? Is it like people like is it people who have remote brands and stuff or is it like you know what I mean? Do you know what I found interesting about running remote? It was the most corporate of all of the other ones. So it's not like the digital nomads ones where everyone's like, you know, wearing no shoes and stuff. So it's five it was 500 people and a lot of them are companies either wanting to go remote or companies like Chase's Doist or you know some of these Deal or Oyster it's company based and some people are wearing suits and some people there's like a big conference hall, but then you've got this whole other circuit of, of that, which is I, I was part of, which are all these digital nomads, remote work advocates who had been chatting online for however, like for however many years and they were all getting in together in one place and like partying together or like collaborating together. And it was, it, that set the tone for the rest of my year. And as I, and I've met people there that have changed the course of my life even. So it's, it's, it's big. Yeah, it's cool. It's like constantly like preaching to the converted. It's like, all <laughs> advocates. it's like, yeah. you should work remote. I do. You should work remote. I do. Yeah. Like, I was like, well, okay, well, what do we do next? Uh, but it's no, all just like, we're, we're, we're all just being there with people that get it. Like they get yeah, this yeah, life. Yeah. You don't have to convince them that you're, you know, you don't feel like a weirdo there. <laughs> That's awesome. Where's your some of your top? Uh, I mean, we'll we'll start wrapping up. But what what are your top um, digital nomad hotspots in Europe, Asia, the world? What are your what are your your favorite ones? 
I've not actually been to that many since I've been a digital nomad about two and a half years ago, officially. Uh, Bali, obviously, is one of them, but it's, it's pretty busy in Shango here at the minute. I personally would say Portugal as a country. There's loads of different places in Portugal to go, but Madeira Island is a really cool one. They've got this mm -hmm. whole digital nomad village there. I highly recommend. Yeah. Grand you Canaria Gonzalo? for me. You know Gonzalo? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and his yeah, little baby Gonzalo. and his wife. Like, oh, they're, Yeah, they're great. They're really cool. So um, in Nacho, it has set up, mm -hmm. he's basically, Nacho is the Gran Canaria, Canaria um, Gonzalo. Yeah. 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 So yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was a place for me that surprised me. I didn't think that that was going to be a digital nomad hub, but I really think it offers a lot of great things like the weather, the food, the people, like the beach, um, surf. So Which one do you think is a bigger community, uh, Canary Islands or Madeira? Oh, that's a good question. I think I would say not necessarily Canary Islands, but Gran Canaria, because some of the other Canary Islands don't have that bigger community. I would say it's slightly bigger than Madeira. Okay. Do well, you think Madeira is bigger than Gran Canaria? No, I think Madeira is, I think Gran Canaria is slightly bigger, but I don't actually know, so don't quote me on that. Yeah, it kind of makes sense, because at least it's like multiple islands and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. and I think Madeira is slightly colder. So I think that's maybe uh, why. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. What What are some of your like up and coming hotspots that maybe you haven't been to yet, but like you're hearing more and more about that are on the to-do list? It's not, for me, it's not about going where people are saying to go. It's the, the places I've had in my mind for a while. And for me, that's Nicaragua, um, Costa Rica and Philippines. But they're not necessarily the new hotspots or anything like that. I don't really care about the latest trends. I just want to go where like I, 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 it's going to be cool. Well, if you not cool, come to hot, this part but cool. of the world, <laughs> yeah, no, I got you. Well, if you do Nicaragua, uh, Costa Rica, Central America, we got you covered. Amazing. Um, I really, I really want to go next year. I'm, I'm going to go next year, so I'll, I'll definitely hit you up when I'm in Mexico if you're around that area. Sure. Are there any events going on uh, in Central America that you're going to? Not that I know of. Okay. I'm going to do the Let's circuit from until like August, September in Europe. And then that's when I'm going to head that way. The circuit. <laughs> the cool. circuit. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad we, uh, we got to connect and uh, we got to provide so much uh, valuable information to the audience. And um, yeah, so if, if people want to get in touch with you and Remote Rebellion, they, they want uh, help getting a, a remote job. Um, you know, take this time to explain how they can do that. Okay. Um, basically, Remote Rebellion everywhere. So the website, remote re remoterebellion.com, on LinkedIn, my personal one, as well as the page, so Michelle Coulson, and then on Instagram and Twitter, you'll see Remote Rebellion as well. So same brand everywhere. That's awesome. Did you have trouble <laughs> getting the the um, the handle anywhere or it was no. free everywhere? No, it was free everywhere. How good is that? Really? That's good. That's pretty good. It was meant I like to the be. So, in fact, yeah, me too. I love an alliteration. So the remote rebellion retreat was just like perfect. <laughs> <laughs> True point, yeah. yeah. And it was like but with the logo, like I got it tattooed on me. I'm that like passionate. Um, it's oh, actually, sure. it's two R's, but it's actually the Roman symbol for freedom. So it was so many like signs yeah. that it was meant to be. Yeah, cool, yeah, eh? Yeah. I feel like I've seen that in Gladiator or something. Yeah. Like it's a, it's a Roman symbol. So yeah, for freedom. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we have that in common. <laughs> we have like the alliteration. My Latin life is a mini, mini alliteration. So, yeah, um, like it. Cool. Remote Rebellion. Um, awesome. Awesome. Love it. Thanks, Lance. Cool. So this has been another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Again, my guest today, Michelle Coulson, Remote Rebellion. Thank you to Michelle and thank you to the audience for listening. Thanks. Have a good one.